So today's episode is on religion, and today we have Michael. And Michael, could you give us a few words about Michael? Sure. Uh, the, the quick version I like to tell people is uh, born in San Francisco and raised in the backseat of a car. Um, a military brat uh, around the planet before I was 19. Um, joined the Navy, got out, joined the Navy 20 years later. Uh, <laughs> um, as you're aware, uh, aware, I actually studied the clergy in two of the 38,000 denominations of Christianity. I don't know why that number doesn't bother people. 30,000, <laughs> and people just like blow that right by. Okay. Anyway, uh, so that's who I am. Um, I didn't make it to clergy to either one. I still study the Bible after the fact. And I could even go into why each religion actually fell out for me before the Bible itself fell out. And that was long before the, the net. Now we got. I tell people we got the world's greatest library at our fingertips. Use it. <laughs> so <Yeah>. that's <laughs> no, hear you all the way. That's great. And of course, we have Infidel and Infidel. Yeah, uh, that was a good lead in for me. So I can just kind of keep it rolling. But um, my name is Dale. I go by uh, <laughs> Infidel on Twitter. Um, and my whole thing is that critical thinking skills are extremely important. Uh, I say this every time, but I do not have a degree. Not only do I not have a master's, I don't have a bachelor's. I have one month of college and I dropped out. And that was community college. So, you know, uh, it really is just important to me to know that, you know, to, to, for everybody to know that we, we can get there. When I say there, I mean, um, be part of these conversations, be part of the important conversations in our society without a diploma or a degree or somebody else saying that you're worthwhile what's in here like michael said like this is what we are and these discussions are what brings it out so it's for everybody and that's kind of my main thing is to show that this is for everybody it's not about intellectuals it's about having the discussion thank you dale that's awesome that's awesome and of course we have professor john traphagger uh, yeah, uh, thank you for saying that, Dale, because I think that's one of the most important things that we have to keep in mind. Uh, I happen to have the, all of the degrees, um, and that does not necessarily mean I'm going to say anything particularly intelligent. Um, it's The issue is really about critical thinking. It's not about what sort of pedigree, as some people will call it, one has. Um, as for me, uh, I'm going to give a little bit more disclosure than I might give, given the topic here. I'm an anthropologist. I teach in a department of religious studies at the University of Texas at Austin. I want to emphasize for anyone watching this that teaching in a department of religious studies does not mean you are a theologian. I study religion as a social scientist. I'm interested in why people do religion. That said, I also have a master's degree from Yale Divinity School in ethics, uh, not in divinity, but in ethics. So I've been around a seminary experience. Um, and uh, I've spent a lot of, you know, got wound up having to study New Testament at the graduate level and Old Testament at the graduate level. And uh, thankfully, I don't remember too much of that. But, um, but the fact is that my background involves a lot of formal study of religion, which has led me to think a lot about what it means to be a theist, an anti theist. Uh, an atheist, an agnostic, and all of those things, and to try to situate myself in terms of that. So that's who I am. Okay, thank you, John. That's awesome. Um, so today's first question, um, I'm going to throw this to Michael. Uh, so here's my, my big question. Under religion, um, do we need religion? Like, does a person really absolutely need religion? Michael? Well, um, as we were discussing earlier, I was raised, raised religious, and uh, my intense curiosity and desire to be act uh, led me to my studies in both of the clergies that I said earlier, Catholic and Baptist. Uh, never got there. Um, but I don't think we actually need it. Personally, and I've actually stated this in a couple of debate groups, of course, Facebook doesn't really count, it's mostly trolling. Uh, but Originally, as far as I can tell, the concept of God was needed at a fundamental process back when we were just learning how to think. So, oh, 
lightning struck this tree, it died, it must be God's anger or whatever. It was, way, it was a way of moving on. We didn't need to think about it. We had no time to think about it. We had to think about survival. Then they decided, oh, well, now we need a structure. We need rules. And sure enough, we did. Um, and henceforth came religions. But at this stage in our development, we got so much uh, countries. I mean, the world's covered with countries now. And these countries have laws. Not all good laws, but they have laws. So with these laws in place, do we still need religion? I don't think so. I think uh, it's, uh, it had its purpose, just like the concept of God's had its purpose. But like certain uh, and, uh, uh, parts of the anatomy we don't need anymore, don't use anymore, like the uh, uh, appendix. I think it's time has come and gone. And what uh, 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 was talked about earlier as far as critical thinking, uh, I think that it, it needs to be, uh, uh, perhaps it needs to be a full-on class in school to teach people how to think, not to, not to memorize, not to, oh, I know this periodic table of events, which I do remember part of it, but the concept of what to do next, how to get something done, how to approach something in a fashion where uh, they can uh, resolve an issue. Uh, okay. <laughs> that's, that's awesome michael <laughs> thank you so much uh dale <laughs> uh i'm not i'm not putting myself on a clock um <laughs> but i will try my best not to be me um yeah i agree with everything michael said um but when somebody asks me that question directly i kind mm -hmm. of giggled when you said it that it's the first question do we need religion first of all you have to define religion um but when we say that word i always tend to gravitate and everybody knows this toward the Abrahamic religions uh, because those are the popular ones, quote unquote, at least in you know, the Western world um, and tend to be the ones where there's the most issues. Um, but if we're going to talk in a broad sense, if we need religion, that word need to me is very important there. Can it be a benefit to some people? Yes. Do we need it? No, like not maybe no. Definitely no. And here's my reasoning. I don't need religion at all. Many of my friends don't need religion. So if I tell people that we need religion, meaning like other people need religion, in my head, that's condescending. Like, and I don't mean it a little bit. I mean, that's extremely condescending. I don't need this. It's not true but they need it. The little people need it. Like that's what it feels like to me when you're saying, when I'm saying I don't have it, I don't need it but we do as a society. Uh, it means to me that I'm saying that the rest of society isn't as capable as I am to make decisions on their own, uh, to face this, you know, and, and, and we talk about this a lot, that one of the things that religion is really useful for, that people think it's useful for, uh, is uh, explaining that there's something more. It gives, it gives people the feel of purpose, it gives people the feel of there is more than this. There's an afterlife. I'll see my friends and family again. And it's not true. It, it's not true. And that's the biggest thing to me. Regardless, even if we did need it, quote unquote, why would you need something that's not true? Couldn't you find something that works better that is also true? And that's the way I feel. So I guess you know, just to end my, the intro is I don't need it. So why would I tell you that you need it? That's to me, that's condescending. Um, it, like Michael said, it definitely served a purpose. Um, and I see how it does help some people, but they don't need it. They can be a good person without it. <laughs> it definitely isn't the reason they are a good person. Um, you know, they would be following all of the rules in those books. And people don't. They use their own minds uh, to differentiate, which is why they would today say, uh, and I'm going to do the evangelical point of view, you know, uh, homosexuals shouldn't have the right to marry. But they won't tell you that homosexuals should be stoned to death, right? That's what it says in the book. So are they using the book and their religion? Or are they using that book and their religion to justify their views? That's how I see that. It's not a necessity. No, it's, it, it's I'm sorry. And I'm like very firm. It's not a necessity. There may be things here and there that we use to comfort us for different reasons, placebo wise but they aren't a necessity. So hey, my, long story short, my, my answer is no. I don't need it, and I think it's condescending as hell to tell anybody else that they need something I don't need. Okay, thank you, Dale. 
Um, that's okay. <laughs> and John, what do you think? Um, I'm going to contradict the other guys a little bit here. And um, I think at the personal level, I, I have no disagreement at all. Uh, I think individuals come at this differently. But as a social scientist looking at the way humans organize themselves, uh, well, first of all, Dale, thank you for raising the point about defining religion. It is a very, very sloppy term. So when we're talking about, do you need religion? What do we mean? Hinduism? Do we mean Buddhism? Do we mean Shinto? Do we mean Christianity? I mean, it's really actually hard to answer that question. So I'm going to turn the question around a little bit in a different way and ask, are there elements of religion that humans need? And I think the answer is yes. Uh, one of the things that we know is that throughout all of human history, as far as we can tell, every single society has had some form of ritual, usually what we would call religious ritual in some way. That's important. And if you look at our own society, um, ritual, of course, isn't limited to the religious sphere. Uh, we have all kinds of ritual from uh, a secular perspective. So, you know, if you're you stand up for the national anthem at a sporting event, that's ritual. And so I would say humans need ritual. I would also say they need some form of structure in terms of social organization. And so if you think of re religion as simply another form of political ideology that's used and an institutional structure that's used to create hierarchy, to control people, to allocate resources, which is how I look at religion. I simply see it as basically, a, and from an institutional perspective, I see it as basically another political system. That's in essence what it is. There's the philosophical side as well. Um, but the philosophical side in many cases is used to justify what's being done politically. So um, I don't really see, I don't see the church as being much different from a government in terms of what it is is it's basically a kind of political structure and it has an ideology. So if you look at it that way, then yeah, we need something like that. I don't think humans can function without uh, some form of ideological structure. They need institutional structures to keep them organized. And so in that kind of personal sense, no, I don't think we need religion. But in terms of its function in society, we need something doing what it does. I don't really think we can get along very well unless we have something filling that role. Okay. Um, so my next question is um, for something that, you know, there, there could be elements that are needed, but why and how does something that could arguably easily be argued, it has no logical real basis, how does something like this keep going through time like it has? Why does it stick with us? Michael? Well, uh, um, a bit like what was mentioned earlier, but I don't see the point in it. But here's the deal. Um, so as humans, we try to catalog, place, and put everything in a spot. And religions do this, but unfortunately, they divide a lot. Because this religion says they're right, that was we don't even need to get in that. Here's the case, though. When we think about why things happen, it's like that story, that uh, old Asian story about how uh, tying up a cat became a part of the service. Now, it's a, it's a quick story. It's like, so uh, this uh, monk had uh, this cat he loved, but it kept interrupting his, his service, so he would tie it up. When, when that cat died off, he got, he got himself another one. Hey, we love our cats but he purposely tied it up just to make sure it won it. Then when the old man died and had uh, uh, younger monks to do this and that cat died off, they went and found a cat to tie up to, <laughs> to put it in the service as part of what happened. So our, our minds have a tendency to want some sort of connectivity. And we do this even as kids. When we got the little square bots uh, uh, in the round holes and all that type of stuff. We try to put things together, but often we do it wrong. When we do it wrong, and then we expect everyone else to do it wrong because we did it wrong. That's what we were taught. Matter of fact, for me, that was a hard thing to get rid of, is especially uh, when I like was studying for clergy, is I was taught this way, then it must be this way. I, I why would they lie to me? 
These are our own parents. These are our own preachers. They're, and they're not actually, in their mind, they are not lying to us. Most of them. <laughs> I won't talk about some of those uh, out there for the finances. But most of them truly believe what they're trying to say. So we, we get that. We get to earnesty most of the time. And we're like, oh, okay, that must be the way it is. No, we, we need to stop, think, and, and actually investigate everything. If someone says the sky is blue, well, is it? Well, actually, science says a lot of different things about what we perceive as color. So, yeah, we need to investigate everything. But I think religion uh, in, a, in a whole uh, divides more than it does. And uh, well, pardon, now we got off this topic. Go back to what you said, um, the specific question. Yeah, so it's just like, how does it keep going? Like, how does religion ah, keep yes, going? That, that, was, that was the point I need to get rolled back to. So it keeps <laughs> because of... Uh, first of all, we were taught it, indoctrinated. Secondly, well, I live in Texas. We got a sign on every street corner saying like, "Church here, church here." So it's an accept, to me, it's an accepted. I hate calling it an illness because seriously, that just puts a bad mark on real illnesses. Uh, it's an accepted ideology which is which divides instead of and that whole concept of divide and conquer. It keeps us at our, each other's level. So, yeah, we're taught it. It's ingrained on us. It's in the advertisements. It's in. It's on. It's on the net. Everywhere we look, it's part of our life. I don't think it should be. I don't think people should go to work and talk about their imaginary friend like someone else doesn't have a different imaginary friend. But that's just the way things seem to work. I'm out. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Um, Dale, how does it keep going? Yeah. Well, how or why? Um, well, first of all, I think there's two part is a two part question, kind of like a two parts go to how and why it keeps going. Um, one, you know, we talk about the origins and not of <laughs> I feel like I feel like Trump oranges oranges. <laughs> you can't say the word origins anyway. <laughs> we'll go back to the origins. I can say it. Person, woman, man, camera, TV. I can do that too. <laughs> um, we we go back to the origins of at least the modern day religions that are still followed and they were propagated by fear, um, by literally physical violence in some cases, when you go to the, you know, the Inquisition and the Crusades and things of that nature. Um, and, and even if you go to the founding of America, um, okay, ready for people to not like me more? <laughs> um, the, well, I mean, I, I know this. Uh, when you come to America and how religion has been uh, propagated in this country, Christianity uh, specifically, uh, you look at the uh, Amer African American black population in this country, how strong that religion still is. And I'm telling you that a big part of that is because it was forced upon their ancestors during slavery. They literally had books titled how to make a Negro Christian. Now, they were whipped and beaten and treated as m monsters and told this is what God wants. So over time, by the way, they weren't, they weren't allowed to read. So they were told what these religions you know, were about and said. Um, and, and you look at today, still, it's very invasive in that community because, well, it was beat into my ancestors. So they weren't going to forget about it and they were going to push it on me because it's important. Our, our brains, the neuroplasticity we talk about when you're younger, and Michael said this, you know, when you're told something when you're young and it's reinforced and reinforced, whether it's through violence or not, whether it's just an authoritarian figure, uh, whether that be your, your parents or neighbors or religious leaders uh, or politicians, and reinforcing this idea that it's valuable, that it's true, that you need it. You know, it's human nature to go along with that. It's in our brains and it's repetitive and we've created those pathways. That's why now when I say to somebody, well, think about it. If this isn't true, what about that? You know, I'm just broad and, and they'll go, well, no, that can't be because in the Bible it says they're not thinking critically at that moment because they've been taught not to think critically about religion. And this is one of my biggest issues with it. Um, don't trust naysayers, you know, never question God. It, it's true because it's in the Bible. I did a tweet about this the other day, but I'll do it again. Jesus loves me, this I know, because the Bible tells me so. I'm sorry. 
you sound like a five-year-old that's not capable of critical thought when you say that. That's why they tell people to do that over and over. It's true because you, I was told. It's true because of who I was told by. It's true because it's true. That's not why things are true, which is why, again, I push critical thinking skills. And the more questions we ask, the more religion fades by the wayside. And I think it's happening pretty quickly now. I think that started you know, becoming a lot more quickly when the internet went public in the mid nineties um, and all this information was available. Now, if you wanna ask a question, you don't have to be afraid of your pastor or priest. You can type a few buttons on Google, you know, type a few things on Google and right. get your answers and go, oh, this is there where the pastor wouldn't have told you that. They would have told you to look in the Bible. Now you can look at every book and talk to every person. So the availability of information, I really do think is and will fade out at least the dogma of religion. But you know, I do agree with uh, John in some sense that um, there are parts of these religions that are necessary. They don't include the falsehoods. They don't include the gods or demons or devils. They don't include believing that the sea was split in half or even that the exodus happened. By the way, it did not. So wh what, it, what it may include is things like meditation, things like, um, you know, the community that religion creates. Um, and like, you know, John said, the standards, but those standards don't come from the religion. So I feel like the positive parts that we're holding on to religion too. I mean, many people say, I'm holding on to this because I have to believe there's something else. I'm holding on to this because something from nothing, and I hate that phrase, <laughs> uh, doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't have to make sense to you. But if you learn a little more about the sciences, you'll see that when you say making sense, uh, the things that you're claiming make less sense <laughs> than you know, abiogenesis or things of that nature, which are necessary coming from the other angle. Why does it persist? Because it's easy, because it's ingrained in us, and because it's easier to not question things. Homeostasis is comfortable. We have to be a little uncomfortable sometimes to find out the truth. Okay. Thanks, Dale. And John? Um, I want to come at this from a little bit of a different perspective. Um, I think maybe one way to answer that question is to ask, what is the function of religion for humans? And uh, I'm very partial to the definition that uh, French sociologist Emile Durkheim uh, came up with a century ago of religion, in which he basically describes it as um, a kind of a glue that holds people together into a cohesive community and gives them a moral status, particularly in relation to other communities. And so in essence, um, what religion does uh, from a functional perspective, this is one argument, there are others, um, is that it, it creates a basis for social identity. And so I think that's actually probably the reason why it continues to go on, because humans need to have some kind of cohesive social identity. And the other thing humans tend to do is they define that in terms of what they aren't. And that usually means some other group. And if you really think about this, you find this in all sorts of different types of organization. It's not just in religion. So that's what nationalism is about. It's about having some sort of cohesive social identity that is then identified in terms of, well, we're not them, we're not the Russians, we're not the British, whatever it is. Um, the same thing can be said, and there's actually been quite a bit of good research done looking at um, sports. And, um, you know, it's like, so Dale, you're from Philadelphia, you're probably a Phillies fan, right? Why are yep. you a Phillies fan? Because I got a tattoo right here when I was 18, and I can't get rid of it. Oh, okay. Well, that's good. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, no, I, I, I agree with you, though, by the way, on that. Um, I've always... And, and, I've always, real quick, uh, I've always been very tribal about my sports teams, and it has yeah. connected me to my local people. However, the more I've gotten into secular humanism and this, I've faded away from the, the love for sports. It's not part of my identity anymore. I still enjoy it as casual, but it was part of my identity that I've shaken. So I think what that brings up is that religion doesn't have to be that basis for forming identity. But if we go back to George's question about why does it why does it persevere? Why does it continue on? I think the answer, at least in part, lies in the fact that it's very effective in creating a basis for building a, an identity as an individual as part of a group. And then, of course, you see it in the symbolic structures that people use. People wear a cross to show who they are. Uh, that's actually no different from wearing a Philadelphia Phillies hat 
It's the same exact thing that's going on there. And so what you're talking about is the way to, that people construct their sense of identity. And in the case of religion, it's a moral identity. But even that happens in sports. I mean, let's face it, I'm a Red Sox fan, and I just know Red Sox fans are better than Yankees fans, right? It may be done with a certain amount of tongue in cheek, but there's also a hierarchy that gets set up when we talk about different sports fans and how they create a kind of moral structure around who and what they are in relation to others. So when I look at religion, I think that's uh, why it tends to persevere. I don't think it has to continue indefinitely by any stretch of the imagination. I think there are other ways to do that. Um, but that's why it kind of won't go away. Um, I, in many ways, would like that it go away because it causes a lot of problems. But I don't think it will. I think there'll always be something that kind of satisfies that. It might be something else that isn't necessarily built around a deity or something, but it's something that humans seem to need to do. Um, Michael, I was going to ask, uh, you had your electronic hand up, and I, I just wanted to yes. know, is there any, yeah, go ahead. Uh, okay, so uh, I do see where, uh, and it's unfortunate, people cannot seem to divide themselves from their religion. And this causes a great deal of grief when people say, well, my religion is better than your religion. This is still going on today. And we, uh, there was a Twitter conversation about this just earlier, where it said, do you think it's possible that we can have a, a um, planet without religion? Uh, in my mind, I'm like, possible? Yes. Probable? No. But even, there's always, okay, so a lot of the concept of religion is based on the I don't know factor. So if, if you don't know something, well, it must be God. Well, there's a lot of things we don't know. And people shouldn't be afraid to say, I don't know, or I don't know, I'll go look it up. But there is that whole concept where, no, this is my religion, this is, this is who I am, this is my identity. Well, it's, it's, yeah, well, you don't see people clinging on to, clinging on to their Spider-Man t-shirt saying, hey, I want to go climb some buildings. That just doesn't usually work. But in religion, yeah, okay, we're going to allow for it. So I see a certain amount of division issues going on. I don't see it going away. And back to your original question, it is sadly ingrained on us that we need it. It's part of who we are. It's like the whole Marine mentality. Hey, if you're the proud Marine, well, okay, fine. You got a group, but that's, are you really that group or are you just a part of that group? And then I think humans have a hard time differentiating that. And that, that's part of what keeps them in that loop is because, hey, that's me. That, I get to wear that cross. That's part of who I am. Sadly, it's not. That's a freaking piece of metal. So, yeah. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you very much. That's great. Um, Dale, John, do you have anything to add on that? Or do you want to... Uh... It, it's not just a piece of metal. It's a torture device hanging from your neck. <laughs> True. And, 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 and also, I just a side note, too. I just wanted to say uh, to John that, uh, you know, I always... People get upset with me referencing God as a monster. Um, and, <laughs> you know, but, but I mean, according to... The descriptions of the god of the bible it is a monster yeah. it's it's a metaphysical being that kills at will and controls everything and you know will send you to hell that's a monster you know but regardless I, when i heard john you know say the uh boston thing i went oh well maybe he worships the green monster everybody's got one <laughs> uh yeah i actually uh i don't actually see deities as being particularly different from how people think about aliens in other worlds that might exist. They're imaginary at this point in time. We don't know that there's anybody living anywhere else in our universe. I would assume there is, but we don't know. Um, so we invent what they are. And that's, you know, there's really no difference between a god and, a, and an alien. And, and we anthropomorphize all of them. That's God correct. looks just correct. like us. The aliens have they, eyes and arms and right. legs. <laughs> right. So let, let, me, let me make a comment, though. I, I, I do think we have to be very careful about talking about religion um, in terms of, of what we're, this issue of definition comes up. Because you don't have to have deities to have a religion. And that's important to keep in mind. Uh, Buddhism... It has sort of, it has spirit beings and things like that, but there's no demand that you believe in them, depending upon what part, there are some parts of Buddhism where there is, but uh, what I study in Japan, um, 
there is no expectation or requirement that you believe in the existence of spirit beings, beings that you believe in gods or anything like that. Uh, the spirit beings, for the most part in Japan, are the ancestors. And if you ask five people what the ancestors are, you'll get five different answers. Um, Shinto has supposedly millions of deities. Um, there is absolutely no concern that you believe that they exist. That doesn't matter. And the reason for that is because the way that religion operates in Japan is a primacy of ritual over belief. They don't have these conversations most of the time in Japan because nobody cares what you believe. They care that you do the rituals. The rituals are important. They matter. And they matter for similar reasons to what Durkheim is talking about. They create a sense of community and they create a sense of uh, caring about the people in your community. But they don't ask that next question. Does that have to be oriented around belief in a particular spirit being a god or whatever it is? So you don't have to have deities to have a religion. That's not necessary. Um, now, we can argue, okay, then maybe what the Japanese do isn't religion. And that argument has been made quite a bit. Um, part of this comes back to whether or not we're going to religion in terms of belief in spiritual beings, which is what Edward Bernard Tyler did way back in the 19th century. But if we don't do that, um, then we've, we've got, it's one thing is it's much more complex, um, but it also means that we, we need to be very careful about saying religion does this, religion does that, because it doesn't in some places. And so we really got to watch out for how we generalize. Hey, hey I just want to interject for one second. I mean, you seem like you were done, but interject if you're not. No, go um, ahead. to me, and I'm just saying what, what I'm familiar with, the, Oxford or Merriam-Webster definition, the first definition of religion, usually, I believe, I think, <laughs> includes uh, a veneration toward a deity or a figure and a set of rules. So to me, when I address it, there has to be a veneration towards some figure. Now, it doesn't have to be a ghost or a goblin or a god. I, that's why sometimes I'll call the MAGA thing a religion, because Trump is that being they're showing veneration to. And his word means everything. They have to follow those rules. So, like you said, it really does how we ha depend on how we defend or de define that word uh, religion because there's such a wide variety of things we call religion. Um, it's the same thing with spiritual. You know, that people go, "Oh, I'm not religious. I'm spiritual." Well, then you have to define spiritual. Right. It, some some yeah. some people's religion is just inner meditation. Some people's religion is believing that there's a monster in the sky that's going to come kill me. <laughs> you know, there's a, a drastic difference. Oh, Professor, um, I understand what you're saying. It's about, there's a couple of things I disagree with. We should never be fearful of defining anything or arguing with anything. We should actually argue with everybody. And well, I agree with you entirely. Okay. And but then, but we have to be yeah. careful about defining what we're arguing about. Now, on that note, though, I understand what you're saying is, okay, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I took a test and it says I closely align with Buddhism. Well, I can understand that. But uh, I had this argument just the other day on the net where we we're talking and people like, oh, well, my denomination doesn't do that or uh, my uh, religion doesn't do that. Well, when you're talking broad scale, okay, I understand there's exceptions to the rule. They're all really exceptions to the rule. But the problem is, I don't have the time to go through 4,200 religions and define, okay, well, I'm going to put in all these caveats. Okay, well, I know Buddhism doesn't fit. Okay, fine. Well, you know what? I don't, I've never seen a Buddhist actually argue with me at all about this. Well, except once. But the catch is, yeah, I understand there's exceptions to the rule. But when you're trying to make a point, you don't have the time to have the no true Scotsman fallacy just keep popping up. Oh, my denomination doesn't do that. Uh, I actually have friends who are religious and they're actually pro-choice. There's not many of them, but there are some uh, because they don't believe in messing with people's bodies that aren't theirs. Okay, so anyways, I want to throw that out. So here's the problem. So I, I teach um, a class in which uh, uh, one of the things I do is I spend a week or two talking about definitions of religion. And you'd think, right, you know, scholars who study religion would have figured out what they studied, right? Do you know how many different definitions there are of just what religion is? 
But there's also an interesting problem that arises. I always um, do my PowerPoints with a definition and then a picture of the person who came up with the definition. We go through a bunch of those. And I ask them, um, what do these have in common? And usually after a while, the students will think about it and go, oh, every one of those definitions was made by an old white guy. <laughs> that is not something to be missed. Because the problem is that most of our definitions in an academic sense of religion are highly ethnocentric. They are actually definitions generated out of the Abrahamic worldview. So what in essence you're doing is you're saying the Abrahamic concept of religion is the one that should come to dominate. But that's not right because you've got a lot of other things. Buddhists are not exactly a small number in the world. Neither are people who, you know, Hindus. Um, so then you've got to ask this question, well, then how do I define this? In fact, what I would say is you need to problematize it every time you think about it and then narrow things down and talk about what you're talking about. So don't say religion, say Abrahamic religion, if that's well, what you mean. That's why, I, I'm sorry, I, that's why I did that in my first, when I first jumped yeah. in, because, you know, that's how I refer to it because I'm <laughs> just stuck. You know, I'm stuck here in America mm -hmm. uh, where I don't have to concern myself with, I mean, even though there are plenty, with the religion of Buddhism taking over my country. That's not a concern. I don't have to, you know, be concerned about, uh, you know, uh, Sikhs um, controlling my female friends' bodies or not letting my LGBTQ plus community friends, you know, have the same rights as us. Uh, so, on my forefront, and I'm admitting this, like I, I agree with what John's saying, on my forefront, I talk about religion. I talk about the God of Abraham, you know, which, which includes, by the, for people who don't know, because the God of Abraham is the monster I refer to. That was started by, I guess, if you, unless you want to go a little further to, to the Babylonian stuff. But if you just start with uh, Judaism, the uh, Pentateuch and uh, the uh, you know, Torah, the Old Testament basically was Judaism. And that was followed up by Christianity which was followed up by Islam, and all three are based off of the original God of Abraham. You should be willing to kill your kid if, you, if God tells you. And that's kind of what I'm talking about when I say religion. So I'm acknowledging that's not what a lot of people in this world consider religion, but it's at our forefront, my forefront at least. I concur with both of you on that. As a matter of fact, when I talk to people, and if they protest, and they, do, they rarely do because they know who I'm talking about, but if they protest, I flat out tell them that the other religions, although they're out there, and I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God, uh, some are less offensive than others, of course, but I actually have a threat matrix. As a former military person, I actually have a threat matrix of what my country is in danger of. And I see it every day with the freaking Bobert and all these other crapheads talking about how God this, God that, whatever, and they're talking about the Abrahamic God. So when I get into the discussion, I'll say, look, okay, Islam is bad, yep, and Judaism is the one that's launched the whole Abrahamic system, I get in the argument with that, and sometimes I get into issues with that, but the concept is it's high on the threat matrix of what is basically attacking my country, so yeah, I understand what you're saying, and yeah, some religions are less offensive than others, but if we can just get the concept, which may never happen, of our religion is not us. Uh, someone said it was, someone actually are, <laughs> said I was uh, saying I was looking for, what they say, cultural, cultural genocide is what they call it. I'm like, no, genocide is one thing, cultural, I'm not talking about, oh, uh, your culture is, is, oh, I get to sing and dance, but a lot of people can't separate the two. Anyways, go ahead. Oh, thank you, Michael, that's great. Um, so the next thing is, uh, and I think, Michael, it goes to what you were saying before. There are like how many denominations and how many different religions? Like it's 38,000 denominations of Christianity. Oh, Christianity, just Christianity, over, over, over that. Yeah, over. So the longer a religion is out there, the more variations of that religion happen. Now, I don't know how many variations of, of say, Buddhism is out there. I know there are some. I know the basic core is no God, but there are some splinter groups that say, oh yeah, there's a God. So the longer uh, a religion is in existence, 
the more um, denominations you got. Uh, Islam claims that, no, they're all one, but then you got the Sheiks fighting the Sunni. No, they're our denominations, so yes. Okay. Well, let me so, ask, I just have a, a question about this. So I, I, don't, I don't disagree with any of that, but I guess I would ask this question. Let's say tomorrow you could snap your fingers and all religion would be gone. Do you think anything would actually be different in terms of people fighting each other in groups? I think that uh, Pascal said it best. Uh, yes, we still have our internal ids. We, we, we want what we want. We want it now. But I think Pascal, this is the Pascal quote that people either know or don't know about. But he said men uh, never do evil so cheerfully as they do when in religion. So now when you have group thinking there, you have a, a righteous wrong, like what they're doing to my female friends, a righteous wrong to be wrong. Um, will things change? Some. At least they can't claim, my God told me this is the right way to do things. So they get to remove that claim. They get to remove that excuse. Anyways, go ahead. <laughs> I, if I can, I'd like to add to that. Um, first of all, I was like cheering on Michael <laughs> because uh, to me, it's the, um, the backing that it has. It's the omnipotence of my claim. It's that it's um, inherently like it's, it's inherently correct. This is true. And there are going to be problems because it's human nature. I mean, that's who we are. It's what this is about. There's going to be greed. There still will be violence. Those things don't go away if you take away religion. And I want people to know that I don't think it's, you know, rainbows and sprinkles, everything's fine as soon as religion disappears. We have to absolutely replace some of those views. We talk about this all the time, like, you know, with, with critical thinking skills. And you can't just throw them in the way you can take out religion. They have to be taught over generations. So... It's not a pull the rug out kind of thing with religion. And that's not, you know, everybody goes, oh, what would you do um, if it went away today? How would you replace this? How would you replace that? PNP. Oh. Um, so, but, but, but so my thing is like, how would you replace those things right away? You can't. It takes time. It's a slow, it's almost like a dialysis thing. A little bit in, a little bit out, a little bit in, a little bit out. And over time, I think we can get to a place where we don't need when I say religion, I, I mean the Abrahamic religions or anything that's based off of, you know, mythology that doesn't have evidence to back it up. Over time, I think we can do without it. And I don't, I don't, I'll add, because earlier a couple, both of them said it wouldn't go away. I don't think it will ever completely go away, but I would like it to be relegated to the parts of society that our Congress people aren't talking about it and yes. that we don't automatically respect someone because they go, well, they're a Christian. So the fuck what? That means to me that they believe in Jesus. I, everything else about them is what I care about. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't have that belief, but it doesn't make you a better person. And, and we as a society really need to stop giving credit to people for believing in things without evidence. Like that's not a plus. You can have it and maybe it may make your life better in some ways, um, but it's not a plus for society to me. Not to have spiritual, quote unquote, practice, but to believe in things, despite the absence of evidence, to have faith in God, like we talked about before. That's not necessary. That part's not necessary. So, Dale, I, 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 I think I agree with you on almost everything you said, but it leads me to a little bit of a different conclusion. I see religion not as the problem, but as the symptom of the problem. The yeah. real problem is the lack of a broad emphasis on generating critical thinkers across society. If you do that, then people can work through how they want to organize their beliefs and things like spirituality, religion, whatever, whatever things they are. But they have this fundamental critical mindset about what they're doing that leaves them open to alternatives, that leaves them tolerant of other ways of doing things. So when I look at it, I actually don't think religion is the problem. It's education that's the problem. It's this, and it's, I will say that part of the problem of education has been generated by what's going on in the United States in, the, in various um, 
Abrahamic religious denominations that are doing things like trying to um, basically eliminate public schools. You know, that's so that they can indoctrinate people into their particular viewpoints, and, and that's wrong. Uh, but I think the sort of the solution to the problem that I think all four of us see as being a problem is to figure out how to generate a broad commitment to critical thinking. If we did that, a lot of the other problems I think would minimize over time. And, and so again, I, I, I actually really think religion's the symptom. It's, it's much more that than it's the problem. I agree. I do. Well, also, we're done. Sorry. Okay, bye. <laughs> well, also Have we solved Dale. all the world's <laughs> yeah. I also agree with what Dale said about replacement. So um, I, I'm a big uh, fan of sci-fi, and I think Spock said it best when he said, um, nature abhors vacuum. So yeah, it needs to be replaced, and uh, in uh, the case, just like Dale said, with critical thinking. And uh, I, I actually try to inspire that in my nephews that are still willing to listen, but it's, it's going to be a tough role, but it's going to get worse if we can't get it out of our threat matrix here in the U.S. because it's dropping fast. So anyways. The, the threat matrix, from my perspective, is really grounded in education. And it's grounded in things like trying to privatize education try uh, underfunding of higher education. How many of you, do you know uh, what the typical uh, state contribution to public universities was in say 1980? Yeah. It's about 80% of their operating budget on average. Do you know what it is today? 20? 10. Oh, wow. And then people- I know, I, I'm sorry I laughed, but wow. It, it's the, laughing is the only response. And then people complain. Why is tuition so high? Well, because you can't run a university with no money. And that's why it's so high, because state governments largely backed out completely of supporting higher education. So you look at a university like mine or any other major research university that's a public research university, they're largely private now because most of the funds come from non-governmental sources or they come from things like indirect costs to support research and that kind of thing, federal grants. But um, when, when you look at the lack of support for higher education and the lack of support for edu public education in general in this country, that's where it's at. That's where the problem is. And if you generated, uh, you know, I mean, I don't, <laughs> I don't think this is ever going to happen, but if you had like, you know, mandatory public education, you just said everybody's got to go to public schools and they've got to learn these basic things about living in a secular society then you can do what you want with your religion. We would have gone a long way to eliminating this kind of, um, this dominance that's coming from the, you know, parts of the Abrahamic tradition. It's not all of the Abrahamic tradition in the United States either. When you look at different denominations, there's some very different attitudes about the relationship to the state and to things like abortion and, and you know, um, LGBTQ rights and all that. So. Uh, but the, the problem lies, from my perspective, in the devaluation of education in the United States and also the idea that I should just be able to teach my kid anything I want to. And that's just wrong. It doesn't lead to a healthy society. It leads to a very unhealthy society. When I lived in when I lived in Germany, their school system, Germans still have a religion, but of course it's not a state-funded religion. People choose what they want to believe, but they actually had a, a good public school system where they went up to a certain grade, and then you can choose either go still state-funded, well, German state-funded, uh, whether you can choose to go to uh, technical school or on to a uh, higher education school, and that's still state-funded. So they don't have this issue with the education going the wrong direction. So as uh, I agree with you, as long as the education is going in the right direction, but the problem I see here is even our politicians no longer give a shit because it's part of who they are. Uh, again, Bulber, MTG, and all those people, uh, Cruz, all those people on TV, yeah, let's pray in public and all that kind of stuff. What are you doing? So yeah, I see where you're going with that. Well, it's possible the US is, is 
basically beyond repair at this point. In other words, it, it may have to crash in some way, whatever that means, in order to restart things in some sense. And I don't know what that necessarily means, but there is a real problem with who's in positions of power right now. There are simply too many people who, for example, don't value education. That's a real problem. Well, one of the, just, oh, sorry. Hey, I, no, I just want to add, because one of the things that I, I, I picked up when both of you were talking, and, and this is American centric, mm -hmm. um, but it drives, when we say religion, again, I'm talking about the Abrahamic religions, it drives a wedge between us. And oh, we yeah. have enough issues to divide ourselves, you know, um, to, to be tribal, to, to consider ourselves better than others without religion. And when people say that it's not the case, those religions by definition, like that's what they do is separate. Um, I don't mean to go all biblical, but uh, the God of Abraham, I mean, if you were a Hittite or a Canaanite or an Amalekite or whatever, you, and you weren't, you know, the tribe of Judea, if you were one of those other tribes, you were ostracized. You were told, I mean, not to go nuts, the God of the Bible, Yahweh, literally tells them to murder these tribes if because they're not going to believe dashing babies if you don't know what that is look it up if you have a strong gut but the god of the bible tells them to dash babies meaning beat them against rocks to kill them and to take the women and do whatever you want with them so when today we're talking about uh you know the misogyny that is still prevalent in our culture i think a lot of that stems from the abrahamic religions now it might not stem directly from the religion but like we said the excuse is built in well god says that you shouldn't speak unless i speak to you god says he doesn't speak to the women even judaism which is you know pretty advanced for the abrahamic religions in america they they have they keep their men and women at least it, when it's not reformed separate and they say that god can't speak to women and that women can't teach the word of god so uh i i don't care if you call that religion i call that misogynistic so if if you want to be a misogynistic, racist, homophobe, then be that. But don't blame it on your religion. Yes, those religious books say to do that stuff, but the rest of us don't do it. So we're fine. Your God's not going to punish me for not punishing other people for being themselves. So I, I'm sorry, I get like I get aggravated at this because it does divide us. And then you have these politicians in America today saying, you, I mean, you know, they're literally calling for Christian nationalism when you get to the people you just named. They're literally doing that out loud now. And they're saying, this is the way it's supposed to be. You have to get in line with us. And it comes to me to the uh, age old uh, Steven Weinberg quote. Uh, and this is a famous quote, but, you know, he says, uh, with or without religion, good people will do good things and evil people will do evil things. But it takes religion to make a good person do evil things. And most, not all, but many of these people, like Michael said earlier, you don't know who's believing it and who's not. I think the majority do believe and they think they're trying to do the right thing. But that points it out. Like what I'm just saying, like they're good, good hearted people who want the right thing, but they believe the right thing is to subjugate others because it says it in those books. So, you know, that is religion. <laughs> it's not, the broad word of religion, but it's the religion that's infecting a lot of the world today. I like the fact that you used the word infecting because it, it's more of a virus than we are because it's, it's spreading like that. It's going from the indoctrination viewpoint to the, the uh, boss's viewpoint to the politician's viewpoint. It's just going straight up the chain of what used to be or was hopefully a secular uh, uh, government. And whereas other countries that actually have, like I talked to my fellow friends over in England, they actually have a church, a, a national church that no one even gives a damn about because that's not part of what's going on in their government. So, yeah, we could do it. We don't. Anyway, go ahead. Oh, you know, that, that's awesome, guys. Thank you so much. Um, I guess, uh, I guess we're getting up there in time, but I want to throw out one last question and hopefully get a little discussion before we end it. I mean, this is just, this is pretty interesting stuff here. So um, the big problem that comes down to is we got all these denominations, we got all of these, you know, all of this stuff. What, how does someone know they are connecting with the right 
supernatural deity. <laughs> like, how is it that people know for sure? Because I, I don't think any of them is, you know, anything less than 100%, you know, convinced that they know. How is it they know? Do you have any insight as to how there's all these different sects, but yet they know? How, how does this work? When I was a member of the community, like I said, I would try to go for clergy too. They're dynamically opposed. Uh, it had more of a, more of a, what's the word? Uh, endorphin sort of concept where, oh, this is right. Ta -da, a little light comes on and, hey, that's got to be the way it is. So, uh, like I said, as far as the, the little notches in both of the two denominations that I found wrong were well, only because I researched it. But if I hadn't, I'm like, oh yeah, this is a religion for me because it's religion of my parents and uh, it feels good to be here. This is the reason why people switch denominations or even switch religions. And I don't, the anecdotal purpose of it. Yeah, yeah uh, we had a famous singer, um, Cat Stevens, who switched from Christianity to Islam. Yeah, you switch to a different imaginary being or uh, process. Uh, it really doesn't matter on anecdotal. It's you're just, oh, it feels good to do this. Therefore, it must be right. Dale? <laughs> that, was a good, that was a good way to end that because, you know, it feels good, so I do it. That's some, the way some people live their lives, which is why I harp so much on critical thinking skills um, and, you know, logic and reason. Um, because something feels right doesn't mean it's right. There are many reasons why something can feel right to you. Um, and, you know, you say, how do, you, how do people know they have the right one? Uh, my sarcastic answer would be because they were born in the right place at the right time where that deity was known. And then they have the right one. Like, it, it's just silly because... You know, when location can determine your belief system, which it can, by the way. I mean, mm -hmm. if you were born in Saudi Arabia, odds are you're going to be a Muslim if you're religious. I, you know, or, well, you have to at least pretend you're one or you die. <laughs> if, if, if you're in, in America, odds are you're going to be a Christian. And if you're in India, you know, odds are you may be a Buddhist or Hindu. Like, there's so many different religions. And they're provincial to, like, a certain area. Like, this is where the religion exists which to me, by using a tiny bit of critical thinking skills, says it's not true. If there was a creator deity, then there would be one, right? I mean, unless there's a pantheon. I mean, most people today think that it would be one. And wouldn't they be able to communicate their message to everybody in every place? Why can Jesus only speak to, I mean, it's not only, but only speak to people in America? Why? Why doesn't Jesus have a good foothold in the Middle East yet? It's where he originated, right? <laughs> Why doesn't he have a better foothold there? Because he's not speaking to those people. He's not. It, it, I mean, I, I feel a little bad saying this because I know people believe that th this stuff is there, but that's how powerful the human brain is. It gets drilled into our minds to the point where we feel and think something and we connect it to, well, it must be Jesus. But we only connect it to that because that's what we were told to connect it to, or that's what society has you know, put around us, um, and people don't know they have the right thing. And that, that's why the scientific method is so important to me. Um, how do I know I have the right answer when I'm going at something? Because it's been tested, and it can be repeated, and it can be peer-reviewed. And people who don't agree with me can run those same tests, and then they'll agree with me. People who don't agree with you on your God, there's no test they can run to find out whether you're right or wrong. People usually just say, it's my faith and you have to respect that. And that's the difference between science and religion. You don't have to respect my science. You don't even have to respect the results of my experiment if you don't come up with the same results. But if they are repeated and you come up with the same results and I come up with the same results and they're peer reviewed and we go through the whole thing and we come up with similar, at least, answers, that's how we know. You don't know things because someone told you where you were born or you believe it and they don't. So when you say, how do they know? It's a different level of knowing. It's being extremely confident about something that you can't possibly know. <laughs> you know, I say, always say there's no God. And I'll leave it at this. I always say there is no God. And then people go, well, you can't disprove. You can't prove that there's no God. And you're right. And that's not how science works. I can't prove that there is no God. But if you give me a specific deity and descriptions... I can prove 
how those things aren't theoretically possible in this universe. <laughs> right. So I can't disprove a creator deity. Nope, I can't, which is why I will never say there is none. How do I know there's none? I won't say that. So, you know, people say that science or scientists can be arrogant. I don't think that's arrogant to claim that I don't know and you don't know. I think it's arrogant to claim that you know, and it's your specific God from your specific area, and you have it right. And one more thing, too. Michael said this. There's 30, 38,000 denominations of Christianity. Um, officially, I think there's millions and maybe billions of denominations of those religions because every individual has their own set of rules that they follow. I mean, you'll find people in the exact same church and the exact same denomination, and one is okay with, uh, you know, abortion and one is not. Well, you then have a different denomination or a different set of rules. So if they can't agree, if one single denomination out of the 38,000 Christian denominations can't agree, then how can the rest of us possibly agree? We can agree that we don't know. And I think it's better to say, I don't know when you don't know. Okay, thanks Dale. Uh, John. Well, I, I would just, uh, first of all, thank Dale for saying pretty much what I would say. Uh, <laughs> I, I think it's a, it was a very, very uh, cogent, very clear summation of the problem. I think people, when they get into knowing in this kind of absolute sense, it's usually the product of programming, uh, socialization. There are different ways to say the same thing. It's, it's um, you know, having been indoctrinated or programmed or socialized into a particular way of seeing things, it's, it's the same thing as, you know, asking, well, how do I know American values are good values? Well, partly because I was taught that with the Pledge of Allegiance every day, and it was pounded into my head. Now, beyond that, I can also kind of look at it and I can step back and, and I can say, well, there are problems with the way the United States has operated throughout its history and there's some good points. That's back to the issue of critical thinking. If we were programmed to be critical thinkers, we'd be in a lot better place. Oh, yeah. um, just a much, much better place. And so, uh, but I think the, you know, the other problem is that I, I do think for whatever reason, humans, crave certainty and struggle with uncertainty. And the, the way to kind of get beyond this problem that we have is to see if we could find a way to flip that around and make people more comfortable with the fact that we don't have to have the answer to everything. We can have, that there are different answers and we can never be 100% sure about what they are. If we can do that, then the focus is on the discourse, not on the answer. The focus is on the process, not on the thing. And if we could kind of rearrange ourselves that way, I think we'd be in a much much better way of dealing with each other. Um, and we wouldn't necessarily have to have these arguments over whether or not there's a God. Um, so, you know, I come down on, on the sort of agnostic side of things. Uh, I see absolutely no evidence for the existence of any kind of deity at all, none. But I also, I, I don't know, maybe there is something out there, I have no idea. Um, and I just don't, see any point to going anywhere on trying to solve that because I can't answer the question. I have to remain uncertain about that because I simply don't have the tools as a minuscule human being to answer the question, is there a creator deity that made the universe? If you really think about that for a moment, that's like the most absurd thing <laughs> that, that I alone could somehow know that there was a creator deity out there. That It's just so silly. So you know, I, so my attitude is, okay, I'm going to accept the notion that I don't have an answer to this. I remain completely uncertain about it. I have a feeling about it. I don't, because I don't see evidence. So without evidence, I'm not going to then say it's there. Um, but I think that's really the kind of the hang up is that we need to get, you know, more comfortable with the ideas as Dale, as you say, that it's okay not to know. It's okay not to have the answer. It's that's humility. That's real humility. And the idea that I have the truth, I know there's a God, that's arrogance, staggering yes. arrogance. And yes. we have to, the only way to solve this is to embrace humility. That's what we have to do. And um, unfortunately, 
uh, I will say this, that I think an awful lot of the Abrahamic tradition is, and, and other traditions too, but not, not particularly the Abrahamic tradition, is grounded in an arrogant perspective about the world and about knowledge and about the way we should behave. Um, and that's a problem. <laughs> you know, I, I don't have a solution to the problem, but it's a really big problem. I, I just want to add one line, if I can. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and you were talking, John, talking about, um, you know, having this knowledge and claiming it. And I do, I say the word arrogant a lot because I think claiming to know something that the rest of us know you can't possibly know. Not, not that we know, but that we can't know and you can't know. So you claiming to know, there is no such thing as esoteric knowledge that can't be shared. And when people think they have an answer like that, that's the danger. To, to, to think I have the answer and you don't have it and you can't get it because you don't have that telepathic or however they want to describe it, connection to my God, that's dangerous. So yes. maybe those people think that they have a wonderful you know, connection and relationship and it probably can do them some you know, good as far as keeping them peaceful and feeling that they have an understanding and they're not confused and lost, but it's not doing the rest of us good that they're claiming this esoteric knowledge that they do not have. So that's my issue with it. It's, it's the I'm special, I'm better, I have this. Uh, anything I've ever learned about the sciences, I can share with anyone who wants to take the time and learn. When I ask someone who's religious how they know, oh, well, I had a visit and maybe he'll come to you when you're ready. I'm right. sorry. Fuck you. I've been ready for a long time. That's not how it works. Let me just add that, that the same perspective can arise in almost anything. So I've run across atheists who are the same way. They know that there is no God. They are absolutely convinced and they are going to make sure that they point out that you're wrong if you think there is, or even if you take a position of, I don't know, that's just as arrogant. And because we can't answer that particular question. And so we have to be able to kind of step back and ask ourselves, what questions can we not answer that we simply have to remain uncertain about? because there's no way to get the data. You know, it's just like a good scientist doesn't try to answer a question for which he can't get any data. Or what questions can we not answer yet? It's possible we'll get there, right. And, and you know, that's something that we always have to keep in mind, that knowledge is not a thing, it's a process. And so, you know, as we learn more, maybe we'll get to the point where we're able to answer that question, but we're not there right now. When, when you say knowledge is a process, I'll go back to your Philly sports comment. I really need a process to trust again. <laughs> the uh, uh, Hi Hippocrates uh, said once a long time ago about schizophrenia, of all things. Uh, it was long before, I think it was before the, the supposed Jesus was even born. But the statement was that uh, men think schizophrenia divine because we don't have the answer but it exactly. may not always be the case and or something paraphrase to that extent and so i concur that if you look at this quote miracle of schizophrenia or whatever now we kind of have a grasp of how it works so anything that we thought we would just attribute to a div divine entity can possibly eventually be learned. But in the meantime, it is a lot, like Dale was saying, it's a, basically, as it drives me, drives me up the wall, the arrogant ignorance of saying, I know my God's right, and yada, yada, yada. There's so much space out there, and you're going to say that God created all this space for you. Yeah. Michael, it's, it's Michael, it's all, like you just said, it's all God of the gaps. It just used to be that we didn't understand lightning, so that's where Zeus and or Thor came in. And now we don't understand quantum fluctuation pre-Big Bang, so that's why people say God came before that. Um, and, and then when we figure that out, they'll say that their God came before that. But when you look at the pictures that we're seeing now from the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, it's kind of laughable. That I mean, I think you guys have seen it. There are people online on Twitter, showing pictures and saying, what do you think that fuzzy thing is? That can't be a nebula. That must be, you know, and it's like, you're going to, they're going to do it forever. So that, that's always going to happen, the God of the gaps. But what that is, is filling in the I don't know, or the we don't know, with your idea of a creator deity. And like John, you know, reinforced, it's okay to say, I don't know. It really is yeah. okay.
Yeah, let, let me let me just clarify too one thing about what I was saying because I, I think this actually gets into the difficulty with words. Um, I think you absolutely can look at particular gods and say, that one doesn't make any sense. That one doesn't exist. It can't possibly be there. So I think you can look at the Abrahamic God and say, that's just absurd. That's, it's ridiculous, right? That's different from saying, I don't know if there's a creator. That's a different kind of a question. So you can, you can clearly look at the things that, that humans have created to represent their concept of what a creator might be. There are lots and lots of different gods like that. And we can spend all sorts of time, you know, doing historical research, doing linguistic research, all sorts of things to show um, where they come from and understanding why they're here. And also understanding things like the function, like the God of the gaps kind of function that we have. Um, that's a kind of a different question from the sort of, I guess, more absolute question of, is there a creator behind all of this? That's a kind of a very different way of, of asking. And, and I think that's part of the problem is that it's so easy to conflate those two, two perspectives because for example, particularly with the Abrahamic tradition, they're answering that in a yes, but they're answering it out of, a, out of something that was created culturally, not something that really is based upon empirical knowledge of the existence of of that thing that might be out there or might not be out there. It's a cultural product and, and it's a cultural product that gets treated as an absolute, as though it's an empirical objective entity, but there's no evidence that it is, none. And, and, it's, and like you said, it's outside of the realm of being tested for evidence. Uh, exactly. If you can't have empirical evidence, how do you know? Right, and, and so there's no point in talking about it if you can't in some way test for it, uh, verify, you know, it, it, it's just, it's just intuition. And, you know, as an anthropologist, one thing I know is intuition is not universal. It's very different for people from one culture to another. So talking about, you know, intuitive ideas about the existence of gods is no different from saying, I think the world was created by the Easter Bunny. Yeah, well, I was just going to say, couldn't, couldn't I, and of course I could say, well, I have faith that there is no God. So don't question my faith. Now there's no God. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly the problem is that if, if you draw upon that idiosyncratic intuition, faith, there's no way to verify it. There's no way to confirm it. There's no way to disconfirm it. There's nothing you can do with it. So that's why, that's why I don't like that word you used in that way. We've addressed this before, but in our society, because what it's saying is this is the idea in my head and I count it as true, you cannot question it. And the way we learn things are, is by questioning things. And I don't have anything. Like if I say, you know, even, even as simple as gravity, if I say, I, I think that gravity, you know, will hold true, it doesn't change, blah, blah, blah. And I give you all these things behind why I feel that way. If you say, I don't think so, I go, okay, well, convince me. Nothing in me will say, well, that's my faith. I have faith in gravity. You right. can't question that. Cut. Stop. Everything that I, every thought view that I have is up for debate and questioning because I want to know whether I'm, you know, correct or not. Uh, not wanting to know whether you're right or not is also dangerous. Wouldn't it be um, interesting if religion were that way? If, if like the Abrahamic religion were that way, where every, well, every idea is open for question and debate and discussion? And, and like I said earlier, a, a lot of uh, Reformed Judaism, at least in my country, I think in a lot of the world, does say, mm -hmm. ask questions. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not. Maybe if it's a metaphor, maybe it's a parable. I felt like that was being yeah. Jewish. Right? Yeah. Eh. But, but, you know, eh, who knows? <laughs> so, but the thing is, they really do. They look at it as who knows. And yeah. let's find out and ask questions. And when you do that, you're bound to come to different conclusions or at least temporary you know understandings of something and they're not going to include that prayer works you know well, it may include that there's something that. else but it's not going to be that specific I'd, I'd have to go with uh and I, I say this often uh that faith is uh, is basically the off switch for the human brain so if we go to the concept that uh humans design the concept of god to so explain light and thunder it is probably about that same time, we also determined what faith was. Faith was, oh, that was meant to be. We're just going to leave it be. The fire started because the lightning hit it, and we'll just, okay, that's what happened. We'll go away. 
So I have faith that, oh, that lightning is going to cause fire. Well, sure it could. But the catch is, uh, so faith probably goes back that far, but it's still the off switch to not ask more questions. Yeah. No That's, off switch. Question, question, question. Right. Yeah, and, yeah. And, faith, and faith is like, I got it, don't worry about it. I, I hate to I hate to do this because uh, this this is get this, <laughs> we have momentum here, but unfortunately, I'll uh, have we, to. We can ask more questions another time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we could we could always continue this. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to thank you all for today's discussion. This was really fun. This was really awesome, and I think people are going to get a lot out of it. Uh, of course, uh, next Wednesday at one o'clock Eastern Standard Time, I will be running a Twitter Space, and uh, we'll see how this goes on that. But until then, I want to thank you all, and uh, I uh, I can't wait to see what people think about all of this and what you've had to share today. And thank you so much, all of you. Thank you for the invite. Thank you, guys. Oh, uh, I enjoyed it. And everybody else, I'm ready. Bring on the hate. <laughs> Thank you all. It was a great conversation. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Have a good weekend. Take care. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, George. Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs>